In this video, we're going to continue talking about the dividend pricing model. And what I want to do in this video is talk about the implications of the model. So in the previous videos, we talked about the equations, how to calculate the equations, how to use them in financial decision making. And what I like to do is just stop and take a step back and talk about what does this equation really mean? What does it mean for you? Um, because <laughs> it's quite significant. Um, I don't know how you can look at this mathematical formula and not jump out of your chair in excitement because the statement this formula is making is so powerful and it's so bold that, you know, it's really quite exciting. So, let's talk about it. The concept is that the value of a potential investment is a function of the expected cash flows you're going to receive discounted by risk. So, if you're an organization or you're a company and you expect to generate a certain level of cash flow each year out into the future, those cash flows are discounted by the perceived risk of your organization and that determines the price someone's willing to pay. So, what does that mean? That is a pretty bold statement because if that's true, then you can increase the value of your organization by decreasing the risk. Just think about that for a second. So if you have two companies, and these companies are exactly alike, they produce the same amount every year, they have the same level of technology, the same number of people, the same costs, two exactly, exactly similar companies. And one company, all except one difference, one company is more fiscally responsible. One company has the perception of less risk than the other company. Well, if an investor is looking at those two alternatives, if an investor is looking at buying one of these companies, they're willing to pay a higher price for the less risky company. And it's because they're discounting less for risk. That's what this equation is saying. Well, that, uh, that's pretty powerful stuff. So let's look at what, what does that mean when I say less risky? What does that mean to, that your organization would be less risky? Well, that could mean a couple of things. It means you have a stronger financial position. It means you have more reliable earnings. It means you have less exposure to risky markets. It means you have a stronger credit rating. It means there's confidence that you have accurate reporting. It means you have strong internal controls. It means you have a history of strong performance. It means you have a strong brand image. And it means you have a strong competitive advantage. All those things could mean that your organization is less risky and therefore someone's willing to pay more money. Now, I'm not saying that your goal here should be to limit the risk exposure of your company to zero. That's not the goal here. Um, you're not, as if you're a company, you're not going to achieve the same risk rating as say, a government backed security. Uh, that's gonna be much, uh, much less risky than a company. But that's not the point. The point is that I don't, I don't care what organization you are. <laughs> if you're an organization, there is opportunities to improve your level of fiscal responsibility. There's always some way you can ratchet up the level of your financial awareness and have stronger financials and stronger financial processes. And when you do that, it, incre it increases the value of your organization. And it's it can be pretty significant because according to this formula, a 1% decrease in risk is a 1% less that your cash flows are going to be discounted. 
So, let's look at this in the example of a city. So, a, a municipality issues muni bonds. And these muni bonds, that if the city will issue a bond, it will get the money from investors, and it will pay off those bonds over a long period of time. And it will use this money to make investments for the city. It'll build, the city will build roads, they'll build bridges, they'll build schools, all really great stuff for the city. But they have to pay this money back. Not only that, they have to pay the money back with interest. And they pay, that interest rate is based on their riskiness as an organization. So the more risky they are, the higher their interest payments are going to be. And if they can lower their riskiness as a, a financial entity, as they lower their riskiness, their interest payments are lower, and they can spend more money on building bridges, on building roads, on building schools. So it, it can be very powerful. And these bonds are pretty large amounts of money. So, you know, a small percentage change over a 20-year period adds up to a lot of money. So let's look at an even bigger example. Let's look at society. Society as a whole. So just taking the United States, the GDP of the United States at the, at the time I'm shooting this is around 16.8 trillion dollars. That's the gross domestic product that gets produced every year. If we take 1% of that, we're talking about $167 billion. That's the impact of, uh, of financial responsibility and the impact of decreasing riskiness by 1%. We're just talking about a small change here. And, you know, if you just think about the people in your lives, I mean, we all know people that have room for financial improvement. You know, we, uh, there, there's people who can't balance their budgets, there's people with credit card problems, there's people who have trouble living within their means, you know, and that's just on the, that's just on the um, low end. We all have room to increase and improve our financial positions. So if we all, just as a society, if we all just increased our financial awareness just a little bit, the impact would be huge. We don't have to change anything else about our lives, but if we improve our financial, the financial decisions we make, the value of everything in society goes up. Because here's what happens. Investors are using this formula all over the world to make investment decisions. And there's, so, there's, there's only so much investment dollars out there. Investment banks have so much money that they're looking to invest. And they're looking at all these opportunities, and what they're doing is they're discounting opportunities based on risk. Well, if things are, if opportunities are less risky, they're gonna discount those, uh, those prices less for that risk. So those investment dollars that are out there get stretched farther and we all get more money in our pockets. That's how this works, and that's why this is so powerful. So let's bring this back to you, because this all comes back to what can you do? And this, this, should, this equation should be very empowering to you, because it shows that you can improve your financial decisions and you can create value in your own life, because Banks and financial institutions are looking at you and assess assessing you this way. And we all have a credit score. And that credit score is based on your level of riskiness. And the better your credit score gets, the more financial opportunities become available to you for precisely the reason of this equation. Because you're discounted less for a level of uncertainty when banks look at you. So the main takeaway here is that there's an enormous amount of wealth 
that could be unlocked as we improve our levels of financial awareness. And how do you do that? You do that through financial education. You do that through learning. You do that through making better financial choices. And if we can all do that, if you can do that in your companies, if you can do that in your jobs, if you can do that in your personal lives, there's a huge amount of value that we can change, that we can add and create in society. And we don't have to do any, we don't have to work harder, we don't have to uh, invent new technologies, we just have to make better financial decisions. And it's all because of the dividend pricing model.